Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's webinar, Diagnosing Apache Cassandra Problems in Production. I am delighted to have with us this morning John Haddad. Uh, John is a technical evangelist here at Datastax, and uh, prior to coming to Datastax, uh, he ran Cassandra in production at his previous company, has a lot of experience with operations, and uh, we're going to learn a lot from him this morning. Uh, before I hand over to John, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you would like to ask John a question, please use the Q&A tab inside of WebEx. Type your question there, and at the end of this morning's webinar, we'll save some time and get through as many questions as we can in the remaining time. So that's enough from me. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you very much for agreeing to present today. Uh, lay down the education on us, please. All right. Very excited to be here. So <clears throat> as Christian said, today we're going to be talking about diagnosing uh, problems in production. And uh, I actually gave a similar talk back at the summit, but unfortunately, due to time restrictions, I really wasn't able to go into as much detail as I would have liked on certain topics. So one of the things that's interesting about kind of diagnosing problems in production is there can be a problem throughout your entire stack. And being able to diagnose just Cassandra isn't really enough. You have to be able to narrow down the problem, figure out if it's your application, figure out if it's the JVM, Cassandra itself, uh, you know, if it's configuration that you need to change or the hardware. So we're kind of going to walk through all the things that you need to know. If you're running Cassandra in production, how to figure out what's broken and what steps to take to try and fix it. So <clears throat> the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about preparation. And if you haven't put Cassandra into production yet, these are kind of the things that you're going to want to know about. Uh, you're going to want to take care of these things, take some notes, and make sure that you're ready uh, for once you get into production, you want to understand what's happening on your system. So the first thing that's really important to put into place is uh, Op Center. Um, Op Center comes from Datastax, and it's basically a custom-built operations tool that's meant specifically to tell you what's going on with Cassandra. Um, it basically, it, it will help you with about 90% of the problems that you encounter um, because it's so tailored towards the Cassandra use case, all right? So if you do end up with an issue in production, it should be the first place that you go to. And there's two versions, uh, the community version, which is free, and I definitely recommend that anyone running open source Cassandra uh, download it and set it up because, as you can see from these pictures here, it tells you a lot of information about your cluster. Um, the enterprise version has some extra features that are uh, pretty useful. I won't really go into detail um, now, um, but they're both very, very useful, and uh, I strongly recommend that, that you use them with any cluster that you have. <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to talk about, and this is, this is just general stuff. A lot of this comes with Op Center, but throughout the rest of your application, you're going to want to use these tools. Um, you're going to want to have server monitoring and alerts in place. And you can use, you can do it yourself through open source software, or you can use a third party. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, in the end, which you use, it just matters that you do pick one. Um, Mona is a really uh, useful tool if you want to monitor uh, processes and uh, disk usage and get alerts when things go wrong. So if all of a sudden you've got a, you know, a disk at 90% full, uh, you should get an email about that. This is a pretty big deal. Um, and it's really easy to set up. These, these things do not, they don't take a long time to learn. Um, you know, you put a few days work into it and you can have your whole system monitored and you can have a really good understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> In this particular case, uh, this is nice because it can prevent a lot of problems before they even begin. So it, you can see in this example from Nagios, you can see that you've got a critical alert on this disk, right? So instead of hitting a real performance problem where you run on a disk space, you, you definitely want to know about this kind of thing ahead of time. And this is, this is stuff that's like 
pretty basic. This should be on every system. Um, there's really no, there's no good reason to not run this stuff. Um, some other useful tools, uh, Munin, uh, Collect D, or Collect Performance Statistics. Um, as you can see right here on the right, we have Nagios. It's an excellent tool. Um, there's a fork called Isingo, which has been picking up a lot of the development. And then, as I said before, there's a lot of third-party services. I'm familiar with Datadog um, and Server Density, and they can provide a lot of the, the same tools. And the thing that's nice about that is you don't have to host it yourself. So whatever you want to do, just pick something and roll with it. The nice thing is with this kind of thing is you can swap out services without interrupting uh, your application. You can run multiple services. So I actually ran uh, several different services. Like I would run a hosted one, uh, and then I would also run an open source one on my own. And it was just nice to kind of have a little bit of redundancy, a little bit more maintenance, but uh, it, it ended up being really useful for us. <clears throat> so the next thing that you're going to want to make sure that you have put into place are your application metrics. And this is kind of where developers and people in operations really need to work together in order to make sure that the system is functioning right. A lot of times, um, it, things are kind of put on operations people, and they don't really have the insight that they need in order to diagnose what's going wrong, because it may not be an operations problem. Um, so what you want to be able to do is, is track a few things. You want to be able to track events in the system, and you want to be able to have micro timers around small blocks of code. And the easiest way to do this is with uh, StatsD and Graphite. Uh, StatsD actually also works with a few other, um, a few other applications. Um, I know Librato is one that you can, you can output StatsD information into, and that's a hosted service. Um, and then you can use either Graphite or Grafana, uh, and I have the two on the right. Over here, Graphite is on the top, Grafana is on the bottom. Uh, it looks a little bit nicer. It's gaining in popularity. But both tools will just allow you to graph things that are not system metrics, so user signups and error rates and people from different countries. You can get a lot of really, really good information out of this. And once you start correlating it with your system metrics, if you see that all of a sudden user signups just drop, well, you know there may be a serious problem. Uh, so it's, it's nice because you may not have, let's say, super high load on your Cassandra servers, but you can tell that, you know, the, my, the, the number of user signups or logins or whatever has just dropped to zero. Maybe there's a DNS problem. Maybe that you have a, a networking issue. It's not always about fixing high load. It's about understanding your cluster and your application as a whole. <clears throat> so basically the gist of this is you want to measure everything that you can that has any sort of significance. Um, the other thing that's really cool about these tools is uh, since Cassandra 2.0, uh, there has been a, the integration of the metrics library, and that came out of Yammer. And the metrics library essentially allows you to pipe Cassandra metrics into a whole variety of different places. So you can, you can spit your, uh, your metrics from Cassandra into Graphite. So you can start to uh, correlate metrics. So you can see on the, the, the bottom graph here, there's a few graphs where there's multiple uh, lines. So you can start to correlate things like JMX uh, information from Cassandra with user signups. And all of a sudden, you understand that there's correlation between events and it just helps you get a little bit more information out of your system. And uh, if you're not running, uh, let's say, you know, you're running other Java uh, utilities and you have some JMX stuff that you want to plot on this, there's a nice, there's a whole bunch of uh, different libraries that you can use, but um, a really useful one is JMX Trans, and that will allow you to basically kick any JMX metric out to StatsD, and it'll, gra it'll go into Graphite. So really, really useful stuff. Just make sure that you have all of your application metrics and you can get to them quickly and you know coordinate with developers and operations and just have some really good dashboards because it'll help you out a lot. <clears throat> so log aggregation is the next thing that's really important. And again, this requires developers and people in operations to work together. Uh, 
And it's the same deal. You can either go for a hosted service, so they've got, as I have here, Splunk and Logly, um, or you can go open source and you can use uh, Logstash with Kibana, which I've used a lot. Uh, Graylog is also really popular. And then there's a whole bunch more. Um, I'm not going to list them all. It, it doesn't need to be an exhaustive list. The thing that's important is that you have really good logs and you have them aggregated somewhere. And this, this shouldn't just be application logs. This can be your Cassandra logs. If you're running Elasticsearch, if you're running um, Nginx or, or Python, like you can, you can always put your logs in this tool. Take the time to make sure that the logs are parsed correctly and finding errors when they happen is actually gonna be really easy. And make sure that your logs are meaningful. Like if you've got, let's say user data, make sure you put your user ID in the log message. And then if they call you up and there's a problem, you can just search on the user ID. And all of a sudden you have a really nice, easy way to understand what happened for a particular user. So and make sure that you solve the problem quickly and people will really appreciate you for it because you're, you know, you don't sound like an idiot trying to say like, oh, I have no idea what's going on with you. You can say like, oh, I get it. Like, let me help you out. And uh, so it, it's useful from a customer perspective and from an operational and developer perspective. <clears throat> so now that we've got our, our tools set up so that when there is a problem, we can, we can just look at our dashboards and figure out what's going on, there's a few gotchas. And <clears throat> These gotchas are basically really, really small things that you can run into that can have, um, that can result in really big problems. And I've actually run into most of these myself, which is why I put them on the list. And uh, they were pretty confusing. And it had a lot to do with me not reading some things. And, you know, it's easy to skip over a paragraph of really, really important information and just kind of, or forget about it. And, uh, yeah, it can be a pretty big problem. So the first one <clears throat> that we're gonna take a look at is if you're running, especially if you're running Cassandra in your server times, you're not correct. And the reason why this is a problem is because Cassandra relies heavily on timestamps and having inaccurate timestamps can really screw up your data. So whenever you do a write with Cassandra, <clears throat> each piece of data is actually written with a timestamp. And the timestamp comes from the server that you're talking to, and it's, it's actually sent to all the other servers. So it's not like each server has its own timestamp that it's using. It's using the timestamp of the server that handled the query. And whenever you have a, a conflict, whenever you say, hey, I have these two pieces of data, which one's the most up-to-date? Cassandra will actually use a last write wins. So it just looks at the timestamp that's on the data. So if you have servers that have different times and one's 10 seconds ahead and one's 10 seconds behind, things are gonna get screwed up. Uh, if you take a look at the example I have on the right, this time on the server on the left is ahead of the real time. In real time, you know, 12, I just picked a number that was relatively low and easy to talk about. Obviously we don't have time 12 right now, but uh, for the sake of the discussion, I think it'll work. Um, if the server happens to be eight seconds ahead, it's at time 20. And the server on the right is behind, right? So it's five seconds behind. So let's say at time 12, we do an insert, right? That insert is gonna carry with it a timestamp. And unfortunately, the timestamp is gonna say 20, right? It's, it's basically the server thinks it's in the future, it goes ahead, it writes this data with 20. Now, a few seconds later, uh, someone does a read and then they go, you know what, I need to delete this data, it's no longer valid. And the timestamp should be 15, right? We're three seconds in the future. But the problem here is that this server actually has a time in the past. So it's gonna say, you know what, let's do a write. And the timestamp on this is actually gonna be 10. Well, when we look at the delete versus the insert, the insert looks like it was done further in the future. And so the delete actually doesn't occur. So you end up with this problem where you try and delete data and it just doesn't disappear. And that's kind of confusing. Um, you will, you will, you know, because Cassandra is, is eventually consistent, people will go, well, I did a, I did a write at uh, consistency level one and it didn't take, 
and uh, what happened, and then they do another delete later, and it works. And it's really weird because your, your servers behave really consistently. Well, it's because you have a really weird race condition. So the, the, the thing to take away from this is just make sure your server times are right. And the easiest way to do this on Linux is to install NTPD. And this will just make sure that, that your servers are uh, constantly checking um, you know, with a correct time and they're drifting back. Uh, basically, it corrects the drift. And if your servers are like way off, you actually want to run NTP date. And NTP date will just basically jam a server time back into the correct time. <clears throat> so the next thing that we're going to talk about, and this actually has a little bit to do with this slide, are tombstones. So tombstones are basically a marker that says this data no longer exists, all right? So you do a delete. Instead of just deleting things off the servers, uh, it's a distributed system. Deletes don't really work that way. You can have data come back. Um, you have to put a marker in place that says there's nothing here. And, you know, I, we've got our tombstone on the right, and this is actually a valid timestamp that's stored in Cassandra. And uh, it has the key, and it has the timestamp. And so in that scenario that we just talked about, where we had back here, we had these servers, and we have this delete, we've got we basically, we have to have that delete with the right timestamp, and that's what exists here. And um, it's, it's a really, really useful tool, and it prevents a whole bunch of errors from coming up. However, <clears throat> there is a problem that you can run into called, a lot of people call just tombstone hell. And basically what happens is, if you've got a really, really big partition, like let's say this partition here, we have got 100,000 rows, and if we're misusing Cassandra and we're trying to use it as a queue, well, we're going to have a whole bunch of tombstones right in the front. And a queue is, a, is just a really bad data structure for Cassandra because we're trying to read things off the front all the time. And we're also deleting things off the front. So it makes it, it, makes it so that there's more and more work in order to do a read. So you can see here we've got 99,999 tombstones. And you actually have to read through all of them in order to get the data that's at the front of the queue. And this is why people say do not use Cassandra as a queue. Every library that basically ever comes out that tries to use it as a queue gets just, it will hit a limit and it will hit a performance bottleneck and you will end up doing a lot of IO and a lot of CPU um, just to do something that's really simple. So use a queue, use something like Kafka, um, I, I definitely would not build Eric Q on Cassandra. So the next thing that we're going to talk about <clears throat> is a, a snitch. So it's easy to, to put your cluster into production and not really think about the snitch. Um, by default, uh, you're just going to kind of let it roll out and do its thing. Um, but the problem is uh, if you don't use a snitch, then you're not really taking, fully taking advantage of Cassandra's high availability. So there's, there's two purposes of a snitch. Um, on a read, a snitch will keep track of the fastest replica uh, for reads. So it effectively lets you get much better, the best performance out of your system. And the, on a write, what it, uh, a snitch does is it will actually ensure that your data is spread out across different racks or availability zones. Um, however, however you want to arrange your data, you make it so that uh, the snitch will just help pick which servers uh, everything goes to. And that's pretty awesome. So what you want ideally is if you're using multiple racks to not have multiple copies of a single piece of data in one rack. Like if you have three replicas, you don't want them all to be in the same rack. If the rack goes down, you lose all your data. And this just makes sure that that doesn't happen. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them uh, list, listed on the left. Um, the one all the way at the bottom, the gossiping property file snitch is the one that Datastax recommends. It's uh, the easiest one to configure. Uh, rack inferring it relies on IP addresses, uh, ranges of IP addresses for um, certain racks. Um, if you're in Amazon, uh, the definitely the EC2 and the multi-region are, are good, and they'll just make sure that you don't have more than one copy in the same availability zone. And that way you can lose an entire availability zone 
or if you have the multi-region stuff set up, you can lose an entire data center, and it'll just make sure that your data is distributed properly, and it's awesome. <clears throat> so this one's becoming, this next one is actually becoming less of a problem, and it's, it's version mismatch issues. And basically, and I've actually run into this one, um, what can happen is if you've got a cluster, right, let's say you've got a 1.1 cluster, and you're trying to upgrade to 1.2, or you're trying to upgrade to 2.0. Uh, what, what I tried to do, which is totally incorrect, is adding in a new node of a different version into an existing cluster. So you just want to make sure that all your nodes in your cluster have the same version. Um, if you add in a new node, basically there's a process called streaming, and streaming happens whenever you bootstrap a new node, whenever you decommission a node, or whenever you run a repair. And when that happens, the, the file formats are not going to be the same, and it won't be able to read the data. So it'll basically just hang. And you end up with kind of this weird system where it says that it's joining, and it'll say that it's joining for a while, like days. And it, it's, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. And basically, basically what you want to do is you just want to make sure that you avoid introducing new nodes into existing clusters that use different versions even minor versions, just stick with the same version. It's much safer and it, it decreases kind of the number of things that are different that could be affecting you. Next question is how do I do upgrades? Uh, so this problem doesn't exist if you shut down a node and you upgrade it and then you bring it back up. So if you've got a smaller cluster, I would say upgrade uh, nodes one at a time. If you've got a big cluster, let's say you've got 10 racks or 20 racks or something, you can upgrade, as long as you're using the right snitch, you can upgrade one rack at a time. So you can shut down 10 servers or whatever, upgrade them all, bring them all back up. And that will actually be fine because uh, hinted handoff, which is the process that happens when a node comes back up, that works just fine uh, between versions. So the, the gist of this is just be safe. Uh, don't try and get clever with your upgrades. Um, just stick to really dumb and simple, and it works great. So this next problem, disk space not being reclaimed, uh, this one is is pretty uh, confusing and really common. And basically the gist of this is, if I add in a new node into my cluster, it gets data from the existing nodes, right? It has to get it from somewhere. and the, the nodes that it gets the data from, they actually won't delete the data that they streamed off, all right? That, so if, if you've added a new node in because you're running low on disk space, you're, unless, you, unless you actually run node tool cleanup, you won't have solved your problem. You'll still be getting these alerts and you're, you're not gonna understand why you're running out of disk space. If you change your replication factor, uh, this is the same thing. It won't just delete data. You have to run cleanup. And you know you can you can reclaim a ton of data. The uh, the other thing um, that can happen is depend if you're running incremental backups, um, you can run into this problem as well. So you're going to want to make sure your backup strategy isn't resulting in you piling up a ton of SS tables that don't need to be there anymore. Um, so just be be careful about that. <clears throat> and this next point is. Um, about using shared storage. And this is a, it, it's crazy, this, this problem is hit um, time and time again, and, and advice is given, don't use shared storage, and people use shared storage, and it ends up being a problem. Um, shared storage has a, a whole slew of issues that are associated with it. One being, it's, you're using a distributed database, right? You're using a, like Cassandra is meant to handle failure, and you've effectively added a single point of failure into this thing. And it, it's, it's just not a good idea. Um, your latency is way higher than it's going to be than if you were using local disks. Um, going out to the network is always going to be slower than using your SSDs, um, if you have SSDs, which is a good idea. Uh, in fact, if you take a look at running Cassandra on a SAN, versus just loading up your your, uh, your boxes with uh, solid state drives, it's way cheaper to use solid state drives. So just go nuts on those instead. 
Uh, a SAN is basically just a giant commitment and it's really expensive and it doesn't work well with Cassandra and I haven't heard of anybody running it, uh, Cassandra on a SAN and getting um, either the performance or the value that they want. And remember, uh, your Cassandra performance or your performance with any database is about latency. So if you've got fast disks, then your server is going to be fast. And it's not about IOPS. IOPS does not measure latency. Um, what you basically you can have IOPS through the roof and have 15, 30 millisecond latency, and that just doesn't work. And uh, you know it kind of it'd be like if we had great throughput to Mars. You've got huge, huge latency, and but who cares about your throughput? It doesn't really help. Like you may be able to get a billion IOPS to Mars, but your latency is is just huge. So stay away from shared storage, and that includes things like EBS. EBS is not good for Cassandra. And that includes SANS. That includes your NAS. Just use the local storage. It uh, isolates failure, and it's great for performance, and it's way cheaper. <clears throat> So this last thing that I'm going to talk about is compaction. Uh, compaction is the process uh, that Cassandra has to go through to merge SS tables. Um, remember, uh, when, a Cassandra, when Cassandra writes its data out, it writes it in an SS table, and that's an immutable data file. So once it's written, it doesn't get appended to or anything. It just sits there. And eventually, if we did this without compaction, we'd end up with a ton of tables. And whenever we did a read, we'd have to read through like, you know, 10,000 tables or something, which is totally impractical. Uh, so basically, compaction will take these tables and they'll merge them together. They'll delete the originals and they'll write out a new one that has all the information just combined into one table. So it reduces I.O. on reads. And <clears throat> it makes the system a whole lot more manageable because you could have, like I said, like 100,000 SS tables. It, it's totally unmanageable. Um, you can then do a problem, and this is something that a lot of people hit, where you actually have too much compaction or your disks are not fast enough for compaction. And uh, if you're running Cassandra on like a single 7200 RPM drive, it's really not, you're, you're not setting yourself up for success. So the odds are you're going to run into a compaction issue. And uh, one thing that's really nice is OpCenter actually gives you uh, some insight as to what's going on throughout your cluster, how much compaction is going on. You can look at it at a per server level. Really, really useful. Um, like I said, if you're before on the original slide, OpCenter does 90% of what you need. If you take a look at OpCenter and you see a ton of compactions occurring and your disk uh, usage is out of control, well, there's a good chance that the two are correlated. And <clears throat> using the node tool command, you can actually adjust um, the throttle on compaction. So you can set the compaction throughput through node tools. So on a running machine, you can actually, you could say like, oh no, I want you to slow down or uh, go nuts. Like I, I don't, um, I don't want to throttle you. And that's great if you're, if you've got a, a solid state drive, you can turn that throttle way up or I suppose down if you're talking about as a throttle. You can just say, go ahead and do 150 megs a second um, because you're, you know, your drives can handle it and that's fine. Um, so there's there's a few different compaction options, and these are pretty important. It, it depends on your workload, and uh, you just want to read up a little bit on the differences between leveled and size to compaction. Um, the gist of it is, though, that leveled is really, really good on solid state drives and read heavy workloads, and also update heavy workloads. And um, it does a ton of I.O., though. So the, the, the gist of it is it tries to keep a partition in as few SS tables as possible. And so, like I said, a lot of I.O. to figure out which, uh, which data goes where. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, you probably don't want to be doing this on, you know, a, spin, a traditional spinning drive. It's going to be really slow, and, you know, you're going to introduce some performance problems. <clears throat> so. If you do have a spinning drive, you're probably going to want to stick to size tiered compaction. And uh, that's kind of like the, the old school default. And it's really, really good for um, write heavy time series workloads. And um, there's actually a new, uh, new compaction 
strategy called date tiered compaction, and that's been introduced in Cassandra 2.1 and backported into Cassandra 0. I think 11. Um, and uh, it's kind of like an experimental compaction option that's even better for time series workloads, especially if they have TTLs. So it's worth checking out if you're doing time series data and uh, you know you, you want to run one of the newer versions of Cassandra. <clears throat> so the next thing that we're going to talk about are diagnostic tools. And these are basically just the tools that if you're sitting on a server and you've got a command line open, these are the things that you're going to want to know to understand uh, what is going on with the machine at this exact moment in time. So this is like real-time monitoring stuff. And it's, you know, you're digging into one machine. Um, I've found these tools to all be extremely useful. And um, they get, they start out with really basic and they go into more complex. So this one's a no-brainer. Uh, I was actually using this right before our, uh, our webinar here. HTOP, really simple. Um, it's just for process overview. You can do all the stuff that you can do with top. It just looks a lot better. And it's a good uh, first tool to fire up. If you're having problems with a machine, you throw up HTOP, it's going to put um, everything ranked by CPU. So it's really useful to see if there's, if there's a performance problem. You're going to know, oh, hey, I've got low memory, or I'm swapping, or um, my CPU usage is really high. It, it, it tells you really, really quickly. The next thing that we're going to take a look at, and this is, like I said, a little bit more, um, a little bit more advanced, but you know, shouldn't be too bad, is IOSTAT. And IOSTAT basically gives you disk stats. And the idea here is to understand what is going on on each device. Uh, what is what is my read rate? What is my write rate? Um, do I have a, a queue? So there's a, a it says average queue size. Right, so you can understand, is, is my disk queued up? Um, hey, wait, how much time am I waiting? And these things are, are really nice because you can quickly, like if you're using a RAID, you can actually quickly identify if one disk in the RAID is slow. So this is a super useful tool if, you know, if disk looks like it's, it's not behaving right, and especially in the RAID case, uh, you can identify the problem really, really quickly. And maybe you need to swap out that drive. Maybe it doesn't work right anymore. Uh, there's a percent uh, utilization that is kind of not always accurate, so I would definitely ignore that. <clears throat> VM stack, really useful tool. Gives you an idea of what's going on, virtual memory statistics. Uh, are you swapping? There's a swap column on the right, it's, or in the middle here it says uh, SI, that's swap in, SO, that's swap out. And you can see uh, BI, BO, that's blocks in and blocks out. And what it does is it gives you an idea if you're actually having, um, if you've hit a memory limit. So if you have swaps still turned on, then this would be the place to figure out if you're actually hitting uh, a swap issue. Uh, normally on production servers, I personally turn swap off. I'd rather have the server just crash. And uh, with Cassandra, it doesn't really matter because if you have multiple replicas, then the other ones will continue to work. Um, in this particular case, I would hope that if you've reached your memory limit, you would actually be getting alerts through either Nagios or Monet or Server Density or whatever whatever tool that you put in place. You should find out about this before this problem happens. Um, so hopefully you don't have to use this tool too much, and you've been, you know, you're told about it ahead of time, and that's kind of where prevention um, is much better than having a problem because if you hit a problem with swap, there's a good chance that all of your servers are close to hitting a problem. So you definitely don't want this to happen um, because it's going to be harder to introduce new servers when other servers are crashing. <clears throat> a, uh, a really useful tool that will uh, kind of aggregate um, a lot of the data that I've, that kind of we just took a look at is uh, DSTAT. Um, DSTAT is nice because it can give you network information, CPU, memory, and disk all wrapped into one. Uh, I love this tool. I actually will go to it before I go to IOSTAT. And basically, you know, it is what it looks like. It's just a lot of information. Uh, generally on a system, if I'm trying to figure out what's wrong, I've got like four different tools open, and DSTAT just took all that away. I don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, you know, I, I used to run IOSTAT and HTOP and, and VMSTAT and like all these tools, and, and now you can just run 
uh, DSTAT, and it does like 95% of the same thing. So, um, you know, if you need to dig into like disk statistics, you can run IOSTAT and get a little bit more information, but uh, for the most part, DSTAT's gonna do just fine. This one, S-Trace, is really, really useful. Um, if you've ever run into a system, and this it, this is this is part of my uh, you know general uh, tools that are useful. This doesn't apply just to Cassandra. In fact, I think this is more useful if you're trying to debug what's happening at the application level. Um, you can run S Trace, and what S Trace does is it will show you all the system calls that are happening uh, for a given process. So you can attach to a, uh, a running process, which is really nice. Uh, or you can run a process with S-Trace. And I've actually used this uh, to find that my process was trying to connect to a machine that wasn't there. So it was trying to open up a socket to some random box. And um, it just, it, it was causing some weird issues. And running S-Trace, it's easy because you can see every every process that's happening along the way, every system call. Um, so I like this a lot. And like I said, it's helped me debug some really weird things. And uh, you can you can optionally filter. So if you do like dash E uh, trace equals network, you can just see the network trace. Um, so like I said, super useful. If you want to understand exactly what your application is doing, uh, S trace is a really good way to find it. It's going to print out a ton of data, so it might be good to uh, put to a file. Um, but yeah, it's great. So kind of on that same. Uh, general useful utility that's a little bit more intense is TCP dump. And what's nice about TCP dump is that you can get a really great idea of the traffic that's going across your network. And you can look at a particular port. So if you want to run this, let's say on your Cassandra port like I did over here, I can see that I've been doing queries. And uh, this is actually um, from a, a project I have called Meatbot. And Meatbot is just a chatbot. And you can see the queries that are actually being sent over here. So it's pretty cool. Uh, it lets you um, trace really anything. So I've used this to watch Redis, Elasticsearch, Cassandra. Uh, it's great. Um, you can also see what's going on. If you're on an application server, you can see what requests are coming in. Uh, there's a whole ton of flags. There's a lot of options. It's a really, really flexible tool. I strongly recommend getting familiar with this. So those are good system level utilities. And um, they're, they're great for, for getting a general idea of what's going on on a machine. Um, Cassandra actually includes a uh, something called Node Tool, which is um, really useful for understanding very, very specific things about Cassandra. And the first thing that we have in Node Tool is, um, it's called TP Stats. And it gives you a really good um, high level overview of things that are blocked on your system. And you can see this fifth column over here. It says pool name, active, pending, completed, blocked. Blocked is the one that you want to take a look at. Uh, for example, if you take a look, there's a mem table flush writer. If that's blocked, then you've got some disk problems. Generally, that's that's what's going on. And it can also, like, blocked will also lead to garbage collection issues because it means that mem tables are sitting around in memory and that memory can't get freed and we need to do more garbage collection. Uh, the other thing that's really nice down here, if you take a look all the way at the bottom, it says uh, message type and dropped. Uh, one of them is mutations. If you've got dropped mutations, then you need to run a repair. If you've got data consistency problems, it's a good idea to take a look at TP stats, see if you've got dropped mutations, and do a repair if that's the case. <clears throat> Another tool that's really nice is, is histograms. Histograms, uh, there's, there's two of them. Uh, the first one is proxy histograms. It gives you high-level read and write times on your cluster, and it does it in microseconds. And you can get an idea of how fast queries are being serviced, both reads and writes, uh, by using this tool. And once you've done that, if you determine that there's a problem, you can use CF histograms, which is on the right, and you can get statistics for a single table on a single node. And this is really nice because it can help you narrow down performance problems down to the table level. Now, if you've identified problems at the table level, the thing that you're going to want to ask yourself is which queries am I executing against that table? Once you have those queries, 
you can use query tracing to determine the query path on uh, what's happening, right? So this is an example here. I have a, uh, you know, this is my tombstone problem. I say, okay, now I've got uh, 100,000, um, you know, I've got 100,000 rows in this partition and I do a select and, well, guess what? They're all tombstones. So nothing comes back except the thing is, I still need to do a ton of work to figure out what's going on here. Um, this doesn't really look like that big of a problem where I am on um, on this drive. The actual time is not totally terrible. Um, actually, no, it is. It's pretty bad. The uh, and, and this is still in solid state. So this kind of goes back to my tombstone issue. You don't want to have a lot of tombstones. Um, this is going to be slow no matter what you do, so just avoid it. You can see the bulk of this time is all the way at the bottom, and uh, it's just crazy. I, you know, it's five seconds. That's just horrible. And you get no data back. <clears throat> um, yeah. So the next thing that we're going to talk about, this is the last, uh, this is the last topic. We're going to be talking about GVM and how garbage collection works. So what is garbage collection? Um, basically, it's an alternative to managing memory yourself. And what the JVM will do is keep track of which objects point to which other objects. And when objects aren't being used anymore, it will get rid of them and reclaim that memory and you'll be able to use it again. And the way that this works with Cassandra is we're using par new and CMS. It's a generational garbage collection. So basically objects are allocated in the new gen and over time they're promoted to the old gen or removed. <clears throat> so once garbage collection happens in the new gen, we have what's called a minor GC. And this is a stop the world operation and it occurs when the new gen fills up. Uh, dead objects are removed, and then live objects are promoted into the survivor area. So you can see Eden down at the bottom. Objects are promoted out of Eden into survivor, and they're promoted back and forth between the survivor generations as well. And after a certain amount of, of swapping back and forth, an object will actually be promoted into the old gem. So the important thing to take away from this is removing objects is actually really fast. And promoting objects is really slow. There's some accounting in the background that needs to happen. There's a mem copy, and it's pretty bad. Um, it's a lot slower than removing. Like, removing is super fast. Um, so there's a couple patterns that we're going to see as a result of this. <clears throat> um, before we talk about that, though, we're going to talk a little bit about the old gem. So after the object has been promoted from the new gem to the old gem, we've got this, this huge lump of memory laying around. And over time, um, well actually constantly, we're going to have what's called a major GC. And a, a major GC is mostly concurrent, so most of the stuff is actually going to happen in the background, and there's going to be two short pauses. And what you don't want to happen is um, a ton of major GCs happening one after the other. Um, you don't want your, your, um, your old gen to get totally full, and your new gen to get totally full because then you will hit what's called a full GC. And a full GC is what happens when the old gen fills up. And basically this is stop the world. So if you've got a 20 gig heap, you're gonna have to look through all 20 gigs of memory. It's gonna have to draw its graph and like do a ton of work. And I've heard of people having uh, full GCs that have gone on for hours. And that's what happens if you have a really huge heap. That's why you don't want to use really big heaps. Um, it doesn't work that well. And basically your system will be completely unresponsive, uh, or at least that node will be totally unresponsive during full GC. So as you can see in my notes, and hopefully you've inferred by now, these are really bad. So we've got two problems that we can hit. And <clears throat> the first one is early promotion. So if we've got a bunch of really short-lived objects and our new gen size is too small, and we're creating these short-lived objects really, really quickly, well, what happens is your new gen fills up. And then your new gen gets promoted to your old gen. So your old gen is supposed to have data that's, that's long-lived objects. Like they're supposed to be things that are gonna stick around for at least you know, a little while. But if you've got these short-lived objects, by short-lived I mean you know, 100 milliseconds, well, that's a pretty short lifetime. If these things are in the old gen, that means your old gen is going to be filled with these objects that don't need to be there. So you're going to get 
a lot of full GCs because you're going to be just constantly filling up, filling up your memory. And the particular case that I've seen this happen is read-heavy workloads on SSD. Um, big problem, and it results in there's a lot of minor GCs to, to uh, copy new gen over, and you're copying a ton of data, and then you've got full GCs happening all the time. So your performance is pretty bad. The other problem that you can run into is a long minor GC. Um, and the, the problem here is if you've got a new gen that's way too big, right? So if you've got this write heavy workload um, and you're, we're, we're, we've got all these mem tables sitting in memory and then we're gonna copy them over from the new gen to the old gen, well, if we've got to copy over like three gigs of data, it's gonna take a long time. So as a result, um, you've got a ton of data being promoted and it's really slow and it's the worst. So a really useful tool to understand what's going on with garbage collection and do some profiling on it, it's uh, JSTAT. So JSTAT has a flag called GCUtil. You can pass it a process ID and an interval, an account, and it will actually show you what's going on along the way. This is also uh, available via JVisual VM, but I personally prefer the command line. You can take a look and there's Survivor on the left, Eden, old gen, perm gen, and then they have uh, counts and times for what's going on with garbage collection. Really, really useful. Uh, other things that are really useful, Op Center will actually show you garbage collection stats, and you can see correlations between GC spikes and read-write latency. Um, you can turn on garbage collection logging on Cassandra. It's gonna spit out a ton of information, and the problem here is that if you've already um, hit a problem in production, you don't really wanna make a whole bunch of changes. I personally prefer to try and observe the problem rather than change something that like will maybe make it go away for a little while. It's gonna be really hard to understand what's broken. So that's kind of why I recommend JSTAT. If you're you're hitting a problem on a Cassandra box and you're seeing no like not too much I.O. and your CPU usage isn't that bad and your memory is not full, it's gonna be really confusing. You're not gonna understand where your bottleneck is. You may want to check JSTAT and you'll see uh, data being um, copied from the different survivor gens or the survivors or Eden, and it's really helpful. So basically what you wanna look out for is long multi-second pauses, okay? And that's caused by full GC. And basically that means your old gen is filling up really fast and it means that stuff's being promoted out of the new gen too soon. And the other option is long minor GCs you, you know, if that's if you've got a lot of objects being promoted into the old gen, and it's generally your new gen is too big. And it matters, okay? It's a big, big deal. This was our cluster uh, at my last company when we were trying to understand what was wrong. We did a bunch of JVM tuning, and this is what we got out of it. So it is absolutely necessary. So what do you do? What do you do when something's broken, right? You get that call. Well, this, this is where all this work that you've done along the way, getting familiar with these tools, this is where it pays off, all right? So the first thing you need to understand is, is your problem even Cassandra, right? You need to check your metrics. You should have all of these in place already. I've given you the tools. There's no reason not to have them. Uh, you could have nodes going up and down. Uh, for that, Op Center is going to be really useful. Look at your system metrics. Uh, if you've got slow queries, you're going to want to find the bottleneck using the histograms. Figure out is it the JVM. Once you've once you've ruled out garbage collection, you want to look at individual tables. Figure out which queries are running slow, and maybe you've got a problem with data modeling. Um, if you've got disk issues, it might be compaction, right? So you just want to use all these tools that I've talked about in order to figure out what exactly is wrong with the system. And if you put all the things in place ahead of time, then this should be really easy. And basically, you look awesome. And you don't have to, you know, you really don't have to deal with that many problems and they won't take a long time to figure out. So that's actually, oh good, finished right on time. So that's the end of my slides. I'm gonna pass it back to Christian, right? Thank you so much, John. So we do have a few questions in the uh, Q&A tab. All right. 
Um, great webinar this morning, chock full of uh, tons of very useful information. Um, we have an upcoming webinar. We'll take a break over the holidays here. And January 13th, um, we will be talking about uh, Spark and Spark Streaming with uh, Apache Kafka and Apache Cassandra. And then, especially if you are in Europe, make sure that you register for the Cassandra Summit 2014 on December 3rd and 4th in London. There are a few free tickets left for the main conference day. And then we are also uh, having training the day before. Uh, John, I think you're heading over the pond, is that right? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So you'll see John there and uh, great opportunity to further your Cassandra learning. Okay, buckle up, John. Let's get through as many of these as we can. Let's do it. Um, Peter asks, does the failure to reclaim disk space apply to data removed via tombstoning? Uh, so you, you won't, <clears throat> okay. So if you've got uh, a ton of tombstones, you're, like if you were to, let's say, create 100 gigs of data and then delete all that data, you would actually have the same amount of information just as tombstones. Uh, tombstones will be removed. There's a, uh, there's a GC grace seconds, and effectively what it does is it says tombstones will exist for a certain amount of time. So you can play with that to determine when tombstones are removed, but they only get removed uh, through compaction. So if you, you could actually have an SS table with a ton of tombstones, and if it's never compacted, it will never, that space will never get reclaimed. So that's another reason why tombstones are, are kind of brutal. You want them to be the exception. Okay, great. Uh, Vijaya, related to tombstones, asks, will tombstones be created on any other action than update, uh, than delete? Example, yeah, update. If, yeah, if, if you do an insert with a TTL, TTLs will result in tombstones. Okay, great. Uh, Pankaj asks, how is latency more with a SAN? I've seen a SAN with SSDs having less than two milliseconds latency and have been using Cassandra on it. So I would say that that's pretty slow. So two milliseconds latency for a SAN with SSDs is not very good. Um, you're going to get sub millisecond latency with SSDs. Um, I'm talking 10 or 100 times faster than that. So, you know, worst case scenario, 10 times faster. A SAN is pretty bad compared to that. And remember, a SAN is so expensive. Like you're not just paying for the drives in it. It's 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 just crazy expensive. Yes, Pankaj, this is a, a, a topic we feel very passionately on. We see, um, you know, basically it's an anti-pattern for Cassandra. So if you need more information on that, uh, please reach out to community at datastacks.com and we will uh, reach out to help you. Uh, does Cassandra treat double zero values as null, John? Double zero? Yes. Um, not that I know of. I don't. I don't think so. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's keep going. Uh, so, all the tools that you showed today are those per server rather than per cluster. No. Well, some of them. Um, like Op Center is per cluster. Uh, something like Nagios cluster. Um, the tools that I was looking at, the command line tools, those are per server. So IOSTAT, VMSTAT, DSTAT, uh, TCP dump, um, those, are, those are per server. Great. Um, hey, here's a question I can answer. We post the recordings and the slides to planetcassandra.org, uh, usually within 24 hours of the webinar. We've had several requests for the slides and the recording, so they'll be on there. And apologies for the mix-up uh, for those um, who did not receive the correct password. Um, you missed a few minutes at the beginning. Sorry about that. Okay, John, uh, does proxy histograms report client request times or local disk times? It's the full time for the request. So it, it's not necessarily 
the client time because if there's like 100 millisecond latency between the client and the and the coordinator, it wouldn't report that. But it reports the total time from the start of the request till the end. So if you've requested something at consistency level quorum or all, it will actually it will take that time into account. If you want client level times. Um, I didn't. I didn't have time to include this in the webinar, but I would include. Um, I would basically wrap your uh, your session, um, your Cassandra session on the client side, with uh, something that does um, that has like a query timer. And if you exceed a certain amount of time, I would send that into Logstash or into whatever log aggregation tool that you want. So that's kind of one of the, the uses for that those logging tools that I talked about. You can log individual slow queries and figure out what's going on with them. Great. Sounds like you've headed to the bar early, John. You've got, you've got thousands of friends with you. I don't think that's coming from me because there's no one here. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe it's Paige. Paige, if you can mute. We're picking up a lot of background noise. Maybe we can mute her. Hold on one second. It's really loud. Sorry about that, everybody. So, um, Miles is asking, which of these diagnostic tools can be used to diagnose after the fact? Well, <clears throat> diagnosing after the fact is, it basically means that you have to have had, um, you have to be recording everything along the way. So I, I like OpCenter, that's one of the reasons why I like Nagios, because if you're recording all these metrics, ideally you should be able to do that. Um, and that's, you know, like the, those command line tools, those are definitely all uh, looking at a system at a given moment and trying to figure out what's going on. There's another tool called SAR, which I didn't cover today, and that's really good for uh, system metrics, but uh, ideally, you know, you're, you should be recording all of your JMX metrics uh, using that JMX trans uh, tool, and you should be recording all of your system metrics. And, you know, if you're doing log aggregation, then you should be able to piece together all this stuff to figure out what happened after the fact. So it's like you're, if, if you had a problem with a machine at 3 in the morning, and, you know, you're going to take a look at it the next day, like ideally you want that information there. So it's a combination of all the tools together. Okay, great. Uh, go, going back to the, the uh, timings there, Radha is asking, how roughly, how many milliseconds typically should we start worrying about minor major GCs? Um, it depends on your application, honestly. So, um, you know, I personally um, have seen like, 20 milliseconds in there, and I kind of got nervous about that. The, the problem is, is that during those minor GCs, if you have a query that started before it, the, and you have a 20 millisecond pause, well, you can end up doing like, let's say two milliseconds worth of work, one before the GC and one after. Now your query just took 22 milliseconds. Uh, is your application, is that a problem in your application? If it is, then that's obviously too long and you want to get that tuned way down. Uh, I think I think that graph I showed, I think that we were seeing 20 milliseconds, and then once we tuned it, you know, we were down to like three. Um, so that, like I said, it, it totally depends on what your tolerance is. Okay, great. Um, our, our good friend Robbie asking, is date tiered compaction ready for prime time? Uh, I don't know of anyone using it in production yet, so I would personally probably not push it out. I would wait a few, um, I would wait a few more bug fix releases before I rolled it out. I would just try it in a local dev cluster to see if it's even applicable for you. And the nice thing is it's easy to, you can change a, a table to, you can change the compaction strategy and it's totally fine. Um, you can, you can change tables from size tiered to leveled, and it's really not that big of a deal. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I, would, I would let it bake a little bit more. Um, maybe early next year would be a good time to start trying it in production. 
Uh, so we have a lot more questions left, and we're not going to get through them because we've got one minute here. But uh, on planetcassandra.org, there's a way to book uh, office hours, which are quick hit meetings with the evangelist team, um, John and others. So if you have a burning question that we haven't got to this morning, please feel free to reach out. Um, let's take just one more. So. Uh, can you talk a little bit about I.O. profile of an app and compaction throughput settings, which are the best based on I.O. profile? I.O. profile. Um, I'm not, is that a specific tool? I'm not really. Uh... Don't know. Let's move on. Yeah. We've got plenty more. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't used I.O. profile. Uh, do, 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 do. How, how do you see the client connection info on Cassandra? Maybe out the last question. Um, the easiest way, like if you're looking for the number of connections, I would use NetStat, just because it's a really simple way to understand like how many connections are open and how many have like recently been closed. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time today. We had a great crowd on hand. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and don't forget, we have another webinar coming up in January. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks.